timer here. Okay. Current time. If you and um, this. Yeah, don't don't say anything embarrassing after you do. What was it Ronald Reagan said? The microphone is on. What the, the bombers have been ordered, and we're bombing Russia in five minutes. Okay, let's begin our um, morning session on Thursday. Uh, so the first speaker of the morning is Andrew Millis from Columbia University and the Flatiron Institute. And he's going to speak on Dirac's challenge, uh, correlated electron physics in the age of entanglement. Andrew. All right, thank you. It is a very great pleasure to be here um, and to have the opportunity, a privilege to have the opportunity to talk, and even more of a privilege to learn about all of the uh, interesting work going on in PQI. Um, so I wanted to thank the organizers very much for the invitation and opportunity to be here. All right, so uh, what I want to do is give a broad overview of uh, where um, things stand in our attempts to solve the quantum many body problem which is one important aspect of quantum physics. All right. Now, um, the challenge from my point of view is that uh, materials properties, for example, um, how efficient a, uh, for example, how a uh, pointer works, um, are control, for example, how efficient a molecule is at harvesting light, um, whether materials are metallic or insulating, whether materials are superconducting or not, and what kind of superconductors they are, are controlled by a delicate interplay of electron-electron uh, interactions. And ah, there we go. All right. You see why I'm not an experimentalist. The two important questions of experimental physics are, is it plugged in and is it turned on? <laughs> Um, OK, sorry. Anyway, um, the interesting properties of materials are controlled by the interplay of materials structure, that is to say, what atoms do you have and where they sit, and interacting electron quantum mechanics. All right. Now, over the years, we have learned about lots of interesting materials that do lots of interesting things. Um, and speaking as a theorist, I have to say that the track record of theory in this field has not been uh, wildly impressive. The interesting discoveries have typically come from experiment and indeed typically from unexpected directions. Uh, theory has been very successful in characterization and post facto explanation, uh, but less so in prediction. All right. Um, one example which I like to cite is just the general phenomenon of superconductivity. Now, this is interesting uh, because superconductivity is a phase of electron. In fact, it's a quantum mechanical phase state of matter in which the phases of the electron wave function are coherent over macroscopic distances. It's interesting for lots of practical and technological reasons. And there's a natural question. In addition to what are the general properties of, a superconduct of superconductors, you could ask which materials become superconducting and at which temperature. Right? Um, the history, which is uh, similar to the history of many other interesting effects in so-called quantum materials, is characterized by uh, serendipity surprise and reasoning by often false analogy. Um, there is no time here to go over the entire history, which is entertaining, amusing, and humbling for theorists. Um, but I did want to talk about the very beginning of the field. Superconductivity was discovered by Heike kamerlingh -Onnes, um, and his motivation was based on the classical physics idea that conductivity had to do with thermal vibration, vibrations of electrons, which then got biased a little bit by an electric field. So he thought, well, if you cool things down and cool things down, the vibrations will get less, and eventually everything will stop. 
So he initiated a major research program in low temperature physics, essentially to see how things stopped moving. And what he found out was exactly the opposite that below a certain temperature, things move with no friction, essentially, arbitrarily well. All right, so that discovery raised a whole bunch of questions, all right? And for example, which materials become superconducting? Um, and this was studied by many people, and I think the empirical understanding was codified in a set of five uh, empirical rules laid down by the materials scientist Baron Matthias in the early 60s. And what Matthias said for his rules for finding superconductivity based on essentially known compounds, where you want to look in materials that have symmetric, preferably cubic lattices. You want to avoid materials containing oxygen or, and similar elements. You want to avoid materials that are magnetic. You want to avoid materials that are close to insulators. And finally, and most important, you want to avoid theorists. <laughs> All right. So, um, in the 40 or 50 years since Matthias laid down these rules, we have a whole bunch of families of superconductors, all of which, except for the yellow ones, violate one or more of his rules. Right? This is a slide prepared by Hide Takagi for a strongly, co super, uh, strongly correlated electron systems conference a few years back. Everything except yellow is materials in which oxygen, magnetism, low dimensionality, and to some extent, theorists are important. All right. There are these five classes, three of which were shown there. And the only point I wanted to make was that uh, these are new. Their discoveries were essentially uh, serendipitous. Um, and they all violated, at the time, our understanding of what we thought superconductors should do. OK. So um, and this is generic in the field of quantum materials. All right. Now, um, to come to the substance of the talk, um, I would, uh, what this kind of thing motivates is a set of rather obvious goals for theory. What you want to do is start with structure, that is, some material form of materials. Here are representations of the crystal structure of two high TC superconductors, and infer electronic properties, um, which I'm not going to go through in detail. Let's suffice it to say that they are brightly colored with many different regions and many different phenomena, most of which were not consistent with our physical understanding before these materials were discovered. All right. And you not only want to know what are the uh, properties, you want to know what are the response functions. All right. Now, why is this thing hard? After all, um, 90 years ago, the British physicist Paul Dirac published a paper which explained how to do many body quantum mechanics. And in this paper, he wrote, the fundamental laws necessary for the mathematical treatment of a large part of physics and the whole of chemistry are known. Uh, and I believe that is a correct statement. All right. So what's the problem? The problem is that these laws boil down to the statement that you have to solve a problem which is, in effect, a linear eigenvalue problem. All right. That's easy. We all understand about matrices. Um, the, the issue is that this linear eigenvalue problem is both difficult and complex. And it's important to separate these two issues. All right? The complexity, if you're talking about a system of many particles, the wave function you want is a function of all the coordinates of all the particles. And even to write that thing down, you need a basis, and you need the matrix elements of the Hamiltonian in this basis. All right? So let me give you a simple example. Suppose that you're not interested in a whole solid, but you want to know, because you're interested in spintronics, about the properties of a cobalt atom, which hosts a spin, on a copper surface. This is the 1, 1, 2 bar, 1, 1 bar 0 surface of copper. Here's a theorist representation of a cobalt atom. All right. Now, um, if you just focus on electrons in the D shell of the cobalt, uh, one thing you want to know is the matrix elements of the Coulomb interaction between these states. If you just do this for a cobalt atom sitting there, you discover that there are 129 independent interaction parameters just for that one simple system. All right. So that, in a nutshell, is why the thing is complex. All right. The problem is also difficult. The difficulty is because your wave function, first of all, 
lives in a Hilbert space of dimension which is exponentially large in the number of particles. You can argue about the coefficient of the number of particles in the exponential, but it's exponentially large. Second, this is a quantum mechanical wave function. The particles obey quantum statistics. And in particular, if you're talking about fermions, the wave function has to be a fully anti-symmetric object. And that means that the wave function has correlations. You all know about quantum mechanical entanglement. If I take two particles which are in a singlet state and I move them arbitrarily far apart, they're still in a singlet state. So if this guy is in a spin up, then with probability one, this guy will be in a spin down. Right? So there's some kind of, as Einstein put it, spooky action at a distance, which puts correlations in the wave function over arbitrarily large distances. There is additional entanglement and correlations that arise from interactions. Right? So this entanglement makes essentially all of the classical methods fail. Right? Now, um, the, simple, the Fermi statistics part of this, that the wave function is anti-symmetric, Dirac and then Slater told us how to manage. In essence, um, you can write the wave function in an explicitly anti-symmetric form. That gives you a basis for formulating the interacting problem. All right? And once you have that basis, then it's a little complex. But as Dirac said, the difficulty lies only in the fact that these laws lead to equations which are too complex to be solved. All right. Um, the difficulty is that if you expand things, not only is the basis enormously large, but the coefficients are not all positive and not all real indeed, in general, and are non-trivially correlated. And that vitiates all of the Monte Carlo and other approaches that you normally use to manage large systems. So to summarize, quantum many-body physics is characterized both by complexity, just dealing with all the real materials aspects, and difficulty, um, dealing with the consequences of quantum mechanical entanglement and interactions. And therefore, and this is the part of Dirac's quote which is often lost, after saying these things, he wrote, it therefore becomes desirable that approximate practical methods of applying quantum mechanics should be developed. That was 1929. That's Dirac's challenge. And what I want to report to you for the rest of this talk is a summary of where things stand in meeting that challenge in the context of condensed matter physics and material science. OK, now, um, the main approach over the years has been essentially to collapse the difficulty and express the physics that you want to know in terms of classically definable things. And in this way, to avoid dealing with quantum mechanical entanglement at all. The canonical approach is density functional theory, which is a theory which is formulated in terms of the particle density, a classically definable object, which is a simple expectation value over the wave function, um, and the total energy. It's based on a theorem of Hohenberg and Cohn, which says that the total energy is, once you specify the electron-electron interactions, a universal functional of the electronic charge density. Um, and a subsequent paper by Cohn and Sham, which said how you actually use that to get something useful. From a formal point of view, and I'm telling you this because I want to use it in a more general context in a moment, um, you should think about this by saying that your physics is described as a functional not of the full wave function, but of the particle density and a conjugate potential, which has the meaning, a conjugate variable, which has the meaning of a potential. So this is a function. This is essentially the free energy of non-interacting electrons in this potential. Um, and then this is the thing which Hohenberg and Cohn introduced. Right? So this thing is stationary with respect to variations both in the potential and in the density. Stationarity with respect to the potential says you solve this problem and it gives you back the density you want. Stationary with respect to the density says that the derivative of this guy with respect to the density gives you the potential. All right. So um, that's what I just said. If you solve an auxiliary problem, non-interacting electrons in a self-consistently determined potential, then you get back the particle density, which in turn determines the potential. And all the difficulty is in figuring out what potential to put given a, uh, um, given a density. All right? And the brilliant insight of Cohn and Sham was essentially to cast the thing just in terms of finding a recipe to get this potential in terms of a density. All right. So we don't know how to do that exactly, as we heard previously. But there are many empirically useful approximations. Um, and this has given you an enormous amount of success over the years, because there are many things which you can infer if you only know the energy and the density. But 
Um, it doesn't capture interesting quantum phases. It doesn't tell you which things are superconducting. It doesn't tell you about correlation-driven metal insulator transitions. There's a lot of topics that it doesn't cover. All right. So I'm going to skip this. But for example, if I just take one particular class of materials, rare earth nickel oxides, if you use this theory, what you get, I'm showing here the electronic density of states, is a metal. There's density of states at the Fermi surface. Empirically, for most of these compounds, the thing is insulating. Right? It also doesn't get the dynamics right. If you look at the one metallic member of this family, this is the electron dispersion, this white line predicted by density functional methods. This is the measured dispersion, this bright yellow. You can see there's like a factor of three mistake in the electron dispersion. All right. Now, there are other approaches where you collapse the difficulty but not quite as far. In particular, as you know, you can express physical quantities in terms of Feynman diagrams, which are expectation values of small numbers of operators. So this collapses the difficulty not as far as a single scalar expectation value, but reasonably far. And the difficulty is managing this perturbation theory. All right. And you can leverage this idea by doing perturbative corrections to density functional or Hartree-Fox solutions. Right? So the canonical things are you can perturb in the energy range over which changes to your solution are made. This gives you the migdal ali ashberg theory of superconductivity. In the interaction strength, this gives you, in essence, the GW approximation or couple cluster approximations. Or, and this is what I want to talk about now in a more recent development, the number of degrees of freedom which are entangled and treated in a non-trivial way. This is density functional theory plus dynamical mean field theory. So these approaches have had some spectacular successes. In particular, the migdal ali ashberg theory of electron-phonon interactions is based on the idea that lattice vibrations only change a small number of degrees of freedom near the Fermi surface. You can calculate the properties of the superconductors, which are written in yellow here. You get a reasonable understanding of where the superconducting transition temperature comes from. The most important thing is that the transition temperature scales with the frequency of the phonon. So to get a high TC, you want a lighter atom. Uh, this reached its um, uh, apotheosis, I would say, in the discovery in about uh, a few years back of superconductivity at temperatures around 200 Kelvin in hydrogen, dihydrogen sulfide. Uh, this is essentially just metallic hydrogen. The reason that TC is so high is that the vibration is that hydrogen only has one proton. It has a, therefore, the, photon, the phonon has a very high frequency. Right? But all these other things are not discussed. All right, now, this business of perturbing in the number of degrees of freedom, this is density functional plus dynamical mean field theory. What you do is you partition your degrees of freedom into a correlated subspace and background. You treat your correlated subspace by a relatively exact method. You treat your background by a cheap method. And you embed the one into the other. So from a formal point of view, well, so I, should, I wanted to say, basically, this works. This is feasible because you limit the number of degrees of freedom which are entangled in an interesting way. From a formal point of view, you take the functional we had before and you add two things, a propagator and a self-energy for the correlated or entangled degrees of freedom. So instead of a two-variable functional, you have a four-variable functional. You still have stationarity. Um, so from a formal point of view, it's very similar. Um, just as with density functional theory, you need a recipe for getting the potential from the density. You also need a recipe for getting the self-energy of the correlated part from the Green's function part. This is solving this auxiliary many-body problem. Right? So you can do this. You get insulating phases right. This is density functional theory. This is this corrected thing, which now has a gap. You can get the spectrum right. This is our calculated spectrum. This is the measured one. You can get the phase diagram under pressure right. Um, there are other materials, for example, strontium ruthenate. This is a thing which is an interesting superconductor at very low temperatures. It has a variety of interesting transport properties. It has a fairly complicated electronic structure and Fermi surface with many sheets and many orbitals. You can apply these methods, and you can get quite precise quantitative agreement with very high resolution photo emission spectra. Um, so on some level, this thing works. Right? But first, the many-body problem is solved in a particular approximation, the so-called single-site dynamical mean field approximation, where the basic deal is that the electron self-energy is local. It acts only on individual uh, 
sites, like transition metal sites, all the uh, structure and momentum dependence just comes from wave functions. Um, so to make this work, you have to choose a set of orbitals which get this correlated treatment, and you have to choose a set of interaction parameters. All right? In addition, these interaction parameters are semi-empirical. In the work on the nickel compounds, which I talked about before, um, uh, we fix that essentially we fix the parameters essentially by comparison to high energy photo emission experiments. And the things that I showed you were based on the statement that if I choose these parameters to get the high energy spectrum right, then these other things I showed you worked. All right. So to summarize, we can manage the complexity reasonably well up to semi-empirical parameters. The difficult part of the problem is treated by uncontrolled approximations, and the way we assess whether this works is a posteriori by comparison to experiment. Right? So this is an accomplishment, but it's clearly not a complete solution. Right? So in the last few minutes, I would like to talk about, uh, sketch briefly, what is going on to do this better. And may I ask, Mike, how much time do I have? Great, OK. All right, excellent. So um, <clears throat> to manage the difficulty, uh, all right, so now I want to just, the essential problem is the quantum mechanical difficulty. And in that, really the problem, as my teenage nieces and nephews say, is TMI. It's just the wave function has too much information in it. And you have to find a way to manage that too much information. Right? And everything that one does in the quantum many-body problem in one way or another is managing that information overload and trying to extract out of this enormous complexity the parts that you actually care about. Right? And the interesting development, really, over the last 10 or 15 years is that the parts that you actually care about, A, may not be the ones which are obvious to your classical intuition, and B, um, can be understood and approached. All right. Now, there are a variety of approaches that one can use. All right. One approach is Monte Carlo. Uh, we saw some of there were some very interesting posters yesterday about this. It's the standard technique for exploring complicated high dimensional spaces. All right. I'm not going to discuss it much here. A second approach is diagrammatics. Here you're averaging over the wave function and expressing things <coughs> in a series of ever more sophisticated and complicated expectation values, that is, combinations of things inside the wave function. Right? A third approach <clears throat> is variational. You take your exponentially large Hilbert space, and you try to identify a subpart of that Hilbert space, which is the part you actually care about, and then within that write an approximate expression for the wave function, which is made up of parts only in that subpart that you actually care about. Right? And finally, there are embedding theories like this density functional plus dynamical mean field theory, which I sketched to you, where you carve out a small subset of degrees of freedom, typically in a real space physically motivated way, right, and treat those exactly, and then self-consistently put them back into the broader context. Uh, so <clears throat> let me talk about um, a couple of these briefly. Diagrammatics. You all know that you can express physical quantities in terms of Feynman diagram series. This is what I sketched here. Uh, the interesting insight, which came originally actually from work of Rambu in the, in the mid-90s um, and has been brought to a high degree of perfection by Nikolai Prokofiev, Boris Svistinov, and their colleagues, says the following thing. Any physical quantity can be expressed as some kind of series of Feynman diagrams. What we all learn in school is ways to evaluate particular low order Feynman diagrams or some particular series. What these guys said is that what you should do is take your general series and sample it stochastically. All right? Choosing stochastically the diagram order, the diagram topology, the internal integrals. Uh, one amusing way to look at this is you take your physical quantity, you have vertices in your diagram theory which are like particles, you have various lines which connect these vertices. These are like interactions. So what you're doing when you're calculating a particular quantity is evaluating the grand partition sum of a somewhat peculiar abstractly defined gas of particles, which are the vertices in your diagram expansion. And just as you would normally evaluate the grand potential by a Monte Carlo process where you add particles, remove particles, move particles around, same thing here. Right? So on this level, it seems quite hokey. The interesting thing is that it works. Right? Um, its strengths 
are that it gives you an unbiased evaluation in principle. You just have a series and you're evaluating it stochastically. It can be formulated already in the infinite system size limit, so there's no momentum or real space discretization involved in principle. And also, because it's a diagram series for quantities, it gives you a handle on dynamics as well as just energies. Right? The limit, the limitation, is numerical convergence, which exists only for not too strong coupling. And in fact, for mathematical physicists, there are deep questions in some of these series about whether the series exists at all. And if it does, how do you define it? All right. Now, um, I just wanted to talk very briefly about convergence. In fact, as you go up in order, the number of diagrams you have grows not exponentially, like the size of Hilbert space, but factorially, which is worse than exponential. Um, the thing which saves you is the fermion sign. Roughly speaking, as you go to high order, the number of diagrams that contribute with a plus becomes the same as the number of diagrams that contribute with a minus because of fermion exchange. So in fact, if you take proper account of the cancellations associated with fermion sign, the number of diagrams that you have to care about at order n only grows exponentially and not factorially. Right. Still, exponential is very large. But that's what gives you a formal justification for this. But exponential is still very large. And indeed, at higher diagram orders, basically the sum of your diagrams is 0. So if you use just an arbitrary Monte Carlo process, it will spend its whole life wandering around very high orders of diagram space, evaluating 0 to better and better precision. Right? That's bad. So what you have to do is use your Monte Carlo process to provide a numerical estimate of all the diagrams up to some pre-specified order. And then you get a converged answer. And then you move the wall. So now you do everything up to pre-specified order k plus 1 or k plus 2 and do it again. And you keep doing that until either things stop changing or you run out of computer power. All right? So in practice, there is a somewhat harsh limit on the order that you can get to. And a large part of the current effort in the field is essentially investigating tricks to push the convergence, the practical convergence, to higher and higher order. Here's just an example. This is perturbation order. This is a particular quantity, which is blurry here, so you can't see what it is. Um, and you see how things converge. This alpha parameterizes one particular trick for getting things to converge. These are three different quantities. These dashed lines are the exact answers, which we know by some other method. All right. Now, these things were calculated for the Hubbard model, which I'll define in a second, which is a simple theorist model. This is now moving beyond the Hubbard model. Uh, Christian Howley and Kun Chen, in a recent paper, have shown that this works for the homogeneous electron gas, up to a surprisingly large value of the interaction gas parameter. You see here Rs of 3. These ends are their notation for diagram order. All right? and these dots for Rs1 and 2 are exact answers that we have by other means. And you can see that this thing is converging even for Rs of 3, and they're now starting to claim Rs of 4. So if one can combine this with real materials things, I think it is a very promising approach. All right, another approach I wanted to just sketch is variational approaches. The configuration interaction approach, if you like, is one of these. That was discussed at length, and I'll just skip over it. Um, there are two alternative approaches I wanted to mention. One based on the notion that ground states are special. All right? And to explain why they're special, I have to introduce the concept of entanglement entropy. All right? If you take a system in its ground state, it's in a wave function, so its density matrix just has one non-zero eigenvalue in the appropriate basis, and there's no entropy. But now if I carve out a region, for example, this green thing, and I look at the reduced density matrix associated with this region by tracing out all the rest of the states, I get some non-zero entropy, which is the entanglement entropy. All right. Or I get a density matrix associated with this, and then I can define an entanglement entropy from that density matrix. Now, what I told you before was that all states are entangled with other states because of Fermi statistics. We now believe that's not true. For ground states, the entanglement is local in the precise sense that the entanglement entropy defined in this way doesn't scale with the volume of the region that you've carved out, but only with the surface area. So that means that entanglement in some sense is local. It doesn't go too far in any direction. So that states inside here are not entangled with states out here if you're talking about ground states. Now, this has been proved 
to the satisfaction of mathematicians for one-dimensional gap systems. It's been proved to the satisfaction of physicists for almost all one-dimensional systems in a reasonable range of two dimensions. And essentially, everybody believes it for higher dimension. OK. So the number of states which have these local entanglement properties is much smaller than the total number of states. In fact, it grows only as a power law. All right. So what that means is that you, in principle, have a power law algorithm for finding ground states if you could grab on to just the ones with local entanglement properties and use those to build a variational subspace in which you diagonalize your problem. Right. So that is the essence of density matrix renormalization group, matrix product, and tensor network methods. All right. um, and I'll skip over this except to say that it can be done um, efficiently uh, by writing things as tensors and breaking up the tensor into uh, lower index tensors. Now, there's a new development um, coming from Giuseppe Carleo, who is now with us at CCQ, and Matthias Troyer, which says that instead of representing things as tensor networks, um, take ideas from big data and make a neural network representation. So if you have a system with variables which are shown in yellow here, if you introduce a hidden layer and write your wave function as a trace over the hidden layer, which is connected to your visible layer by connections, then this will provide a representation of an entangled state of these variables. The entanglement comes from tracing over the hidden layer. All right? um, you can get the entanglement entropy essentially by deciding where to cut this. Each connection here that cuts, between, cutting a connection which goes from here to here to here gives you some entanglement. So this gives you a way to represent states. All right? And the interesting point is that to represent a given state, you don't need an exponentially large amount of information. If you have n states here and m states here, then basically you have n times m plus the h parameters here, n plus 1 times m parameters in this thing. OK, so it gives you a compact representation of states, which you can then attempt to use as a variational basis. Right? Now, um, this works very well for spin systems. There's a complication in representing fermions. All right? I told you that fermion wave functions need to be anti-symmetric under permutation. So you have to not just write this wave function, but you have to make sure that it knows that it's anti-symmetric when you take expectation values. Now, in one dimension, this is easy. There's a mapping between fermions and bosons that leads to something called a jordan Wigner string. It, what it boils down to is that you can get the sign under permutations just by starting at one end of your system and proceeding simply along your chain. You go to higher dimensions, and this turns into a mess. Right? There are ways around the mess which work, although they're inelegant, inelegant in two dimensions. In three dimensions, it gets much harder. So representing fermions efficiently is the big obstacle in this, but otherwise it works. OK, then there's embedding, which I'm going to skip over. There's lots of different things. All right, now, just briefly, so that means that we have many new or newly improved methods for attacking the quantum many body problem. Each one of them hits an exponential wall at some point. And the question is, how do you close the gap between the exponential wall that every method hits and the things that you want to calculate? And these dragon, this figure was made by my colleague, uh, Emmanuel Gull. All right. So to do this, what's essential is benchmarking. All right? um, what you have to do is take all of these methods and attack the same problem with them and make sure that you get the same answer. All right? Doing this allows us to understand capabilities, guide decisions and applications, and produce references for future development. And just this thing I put in the box I think is important and has been insufficiently appreciated by the physics community, although the chemists understand it very well that complementary methods implied to the same problem are a valuable paradigm of attack. It's only when you have several things that you can compare that you really know what you're doing and that it's right. So in the context of the Simons Foundation Many Electron Collaboration, with all these people, we have done this. We have benchmarked the Hubbard model and more sophisticated models. Now, I'm just going to skim over this briefly because we're basically out of time. These are a couple of examples from our paper. Um, what I want you to take away from this mainly is that there's lots of colors on this figure. Right? So this is the energy. We see you're changing only in the last decimal place. These are a bunch of different methods with different a priori errors. And the point I want to make is that they are now converging to the same answer for the infinite system size. All right? This is the same thing for diagrammatic Monte Carlo and embedding methods. All right, and for dynamics. So the upshot is that 
this correspondence has given us a reasonable handle on the behavior of the Hubbard model. Now, because we're out of time, I'll skip over a lot of the physics and just say that we now have confidence, I think, that the Hubbard model has superconducting ground states in some parameter region. The superconducting ground states are of the dx squared minus y squared type that is observed in the cuprates. Um, uh, we know how within this theory to optimize the transition temperature. And we also know uh, something about competition between superconductivity and other states. So this was a paper that came out of our collaboration with the addition of Philippe Corbeau in Amsterdam. Um, in which the competition at a particular strong correlation value between superconductivity and a particular electron concentration between superconductivity and stripes was studied. These are the energies in units of the basic hopping. The basic scale is 0.01. The conclusion is that the ground state, there is a superconducting state which is locally stable. The ground state has vertical stripes. And basically, all the different methods agree to within basically one-tenth of a percent of the basic hopping on what the energy is and what that ground state is. Right? Now, I should say that while everybody agrees that there are stripes, these are four different methods. You see there is a pattern which has the same basic spatial structure, but the details disagree on the 30 or 40 percent level. All right? So that, I think, is the state of the art in this. Everybody agrees that at one-eighth doping in u equals eight, there are stripes, the exact properties of stripes there's still not convergence. And just as a minor point, which should be understood physically, everybody also agrees that the wavelength of the stripe is only very, very weakly determined. The stripe could have wavelength 5, 6, 7, 8, and the energy almost doesn't care. That's remarkable, and I think is still not understood. OK, so what happens if you move away from this special point is in process. Now, let me just skim over the properties of the superconducting state if it, it exists, and just to say that it agrees reasonably well with experiment, and we can now start to diagnose where the superconductivity comes from. My favorite thing in conventional superconductivity is the scalapino macmillan rowell analysis, which says that you look at the gap function, defined in terms of the real and anomalous parts of the self-energy. This thing has structure, which can be detected by tunneling experiments, at frequencies of the object which is giving you the pairing. All right? So we can interrogate our solution for superconductivity. Here's the gap function defined in their way. It has structure at two frequencies. We can compare it to the independently calculated spin fluctuation spectrum. These are preliminary results. We still have to get the bugs out of some of it. But what you see is that there's a quite strong correspondence between the spin fluctuation spectrum and the low frequency part of the gap function. But this peak up here is just not present. So it suggests that in the Hubbard model, the pairing is not entirely due to spin fluctuations, that there is something else going on. This conclusion I emphasize is preliminary, um, but that's where we are. There's no paper yet. That's where we are at present. OK, so um, I think that at this point, I will just say briefly, we're also starting to add back complexity. Uh, a simple model to do benchmarking on is the hydrogen chain, just a string of protons with some spacing. here. Uh, this gives you access to the basis set issue. We can now do this in the complete basis set limit and to the full matrix elements of the Coulomb interaction. Um, so I'll just skip over this since I think my time is out. There's a lot of stuff here that uh, we don't have to go in and just say that, again, within a range of methods, there's now complete agreement on the um, equation of state and interesting stuff about the physical properties, uh, which I don't have time to discuss here. So with that, I will say that we can now compare results between methods um, and that we're a fair way along to actually developing approximate methods to solve the quantum many body problem. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'll stop at this point. Time for a few questions. Bob Griffiths. Uh, can you say something about the potential for quantum computers to get around your fermion ah, uh, problem? Yes. Well, um, look at um, basically what quantum computers do, as we heard yesterday, was give you, uh, in principle, much better ways of diagonalizing big matrices. So it doesn't buy, get you around uh, uh, the direct quantum computer doesn't get you around the fermion sign problem. But once you cast it as diagonalizing a big matrix, in principle, it's much more efficient. 
All right. Um, now, uh, the devil, as always, is in the details. And the problem is that to get these things to work, you need so many ancillary qubits to keep everything phase coherent that um, it's not obvious yet how well this is going to work. Um, this is a research activity. Um, right now, people are trying to define, in essence, hybrid quantum classical algorithms where you can carve out a particular quantum part, a particular part to do with a modest sized quantum computer and combine it with other classical things. Um, to my knowledge, the, the hotbed of this research is the Google Quantum Computing Group in Venice Beach in California. And Garnet Chen, who is one of our collaborators, is heavily entangled with them. Um, and it's one of the uses is in these embedding theories, as I described before, where you carve out a particular subproblem and then use a quantum uh, and then use some method to solve that. Anyway, but so at the moment, people are fooling around with this, but it hasn't yet had any use. Thank you. OK, we have time for one more question. Kant Kerr. So this is regarding the uh, diagrammatic Monte Carlo. Yeah. So I under, as I understand it, so it can do a homogeneous electron gas, which Christian and others have, and his postdoc yeah. has done. Also, it can do Hubbard model, I guess. Yes, that was the first so thing I showed, yes. What would be the strategy, let's say, if we wanted to actually do a real materials and in, 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 use it via diagrammatic Monte Carlo? What would be the path? Well, I mean, in principle, there's nothing to it. Um, here, let me just. Uh, <laughs> um, in principle, uh, that is exactly that is what um, Jen Kozik has committed to doing. He is supposed to give me lithium dihydride or silicon via diagrammatic Monte Carlo. So what's right. his, uh, but so, so in practice, you, you have a Monte Carlo. What, what the, the technical issues are really you need a basis set all right, and um, matrix elements. But that's the diagrammatic Monte Carlo algorithm doesn't care. right? You have vertices, and it's just a question of how you actually write those vertices. You have propagators. It's just a question of what basis you use to write those propagators. So in practical terms, there's a serious question. Do you use plane waves? Do you use pseudopotentials? How do you put your cutoff? There's a large amount of what you might say is engineering in there. And it's an interesting question how much of that um, can be lifted from the enormous amount of engineering which has already gone into doing conventional DFT calculations and how much has to be redone to mesh smoothly with the diagrammatic Monte Carlo. But in principle, there's no problem. Uh, provided that the RS isn't too big. I mean, that's the, the real question is these things, uh, the question is, does your series converge before the number of diagrams is so high that you can't evaluate them, even stochastically? So is RS equals three? So it's amazing to me, very impressive, that Haole and Chen have gotten for the uniform electron gas as far as RS of three or four. Most solids are RS of four, five, six. So it, it remains to be seen. But some of these simple, simple materials, the RS, should be, in effect, small enough that this should work. And the next talk is going to be given by Jeremy Levy, which has the title listed as uh, One Dimensional Quantum Simulation. All right, well, it's great to be here in Pittsburgh with so many guests, and uh, uh, wonderful um, to have uh, all of you here. And um, I want to um, talk uh, a little bit about some of the uh, research directions uh, in my group, uh, specifically uh, one that is um, maybe sort of experimental um, component of trying to understand quantum materials um, and uh, taking advantage of some uh, unique properties of um, uh, c conductive uh, oxide uh, heterostructures. So uh, this is work has been going on for, for many years uh, in my group, and 
Um, what you're seeing on the right is a, a list of um, uh, mostly graduate students, um, a, a few uh, postdocs. Um, on the left, uh, what you see are uh, 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 external uh, or also de departmental collaborators, so David Pecker, Roger Mong, and um, their students. Uh, the, the materials that I work with are grown in the group of Chang Bom Ohm at the University of Wisconsin. Um, and of course, we think of Andrew Daly as a, an internal collaborator, but he's um, in Strathclyde now, and his uh, group uh, members, uh, Elliot and Francois, are here. Uh, very happy to have them. Um, what I'm going to be talking about uh, today um, is uh, principally the, the research, the thesis work, um, uh, which is uh, of, of Megan uh, Bridgman, uh, who uh, has been uh, working for, uh, for many years and has de de developed um, uh, a, a platform which we believe um, can both provide insight and maybe um, uh, create uh, new forms of quantum matter um, through this technique that I'll be telling you about. So uh, the field, uh, the, the, the bigger picture um, is that we're trying to create a field that does, does not really exist at the moment. Uh, and it's uh, correlated nanoelectronics, which is the mashup of two well-established fields. So uh, on the one hand, you have correlated uh, electronic materials that have uh, a variety of properties like superconductivity. This is, a, of course, a high temperature superconductor. Uh, and they're complicated, and they tend to be uh, uh, in the bulk. Uh, and then on the other side, you have semiconductor nanoelectronics, which is, uh, this is sort of the research sidecar of you know, technology development. Um, uh, but here you have high mobility uh, electrons uh, at interfaces, uh, and then they can be controlled down to the single electron and, uh, level, and, and you can take uh, advantage of uh, their uh, clean properties uh, at the um, very fundamental level. So we're interested in combining these two paradigms, and really the people who work in these two areas they generally don't go to the same conferences. Um, so that's what I mean by distinct fields. Um, but we want to bring them together um, in interesting ways. And they're sort of, uh, what we're doing now is sort of uh, both uh, perturbative in an intellectual sense, um, where we, let's say, start with one field, like semiconductor nanoelectronics, and add a little bit of the other field. Um, and uh, if you do that, you get uh, interesting results. And I'll be telling you a little bit about that. Um, but then you can also go in the other direction and say, wow, uh, superconductivity is hard. We don't understand it. Um, maybe. Uh, the, by basically creating very small devices that are sensitive to microscopic properties, we can understand something very basic. Uh, and then you might actually be, uh, think about the non-perturbative regime as well. So uh, these two fields uh, uh, literally uh, as well as figuratively intersect um, in these oxide heterostructures, which we're interested in. Uh, and if you've seen some of the posters, you, you can see that we've gone all in on this one system, um, but I'll try to explain why um, it's not that restrictive. So basically, you have these two uh, insulators, strontium titanate and lanthanum aluminate, and separately they're insulating. Uh, but uh, when you put them together, it was discovered um, by Otomo and Huang that you could get an emergent conductive uh, layer at the interface. And, um, and uh, this really sort of started to snowball in terms of uh, understanding um, and revealing and uh, um, reminding people of all of the interesting properties of the electronic side of this, which is all in the strontium titanate. So basically, you have a very sharp insulator to metal transition uh, as a function of how many of these unit cells of lanthanum aluminate. You have emergent uh, superconductivity, which was known since the 60s, but basically is now in two-dimensional form. Um, emergence of magnetism, uh, tunable spin-orbit interactions, and so on. So uh, this is a very rich uh, interface system. Um, and what we uh, brought to this is the ability to control whether this system is conducting or insulating on the scale of just a few nanometers. And the way that we do this is analogous to um, basically a toy that I used to play with not very well, but I used to play with it as a child. Um, basically, etch a sketch where you, uh, if you were to uh, rip it apart, and I don't recommend that, but you would see that there's aluminum powder inside, and that powder sticks to the inside of this plastic sheet, uh, and it's sort of a bright, diffuse, reflective surface. And then you can scrape off, or etch, as they call it, the uh, aluminum powder, and then you have 
uh, transmission and absorption of light. And so those regions look dark, and you can move the stylus around in the horizontal and vertical direction to create patterns um, at the milli mill millimeter scale. And you can also, it's reversible. So you can turn it upside down and shake it, and then go back to the uh, conductive uh, bright state. So this is a great thing. Of course, now there's an app for that, right? But we don't want to go there. That's not the point. Um, the, the point is that it's sort of etched in my brain, and I'm always, it's always thinking about how we could sort of recreate this, uh, this freedom uh, control. Uh, and so what we do now is, of course, we don't work with toys. We work with tools, which are more expensive toys. Um, and uh, basically, uh, so specifically an atomic force microscope, uh, which has a sharp conductive probe, and we're going to use this probe to uh, locally switch the um, conductive properties of the same interface that I told you about. So basically, uh, the structure that we're interested in is a very uh, thin layer of lanthanum aluminate, which is an insulator, uh, and then the strontium titanate is just below. That's a bulk material. And then we make electrical contact to the interface, which defines this um, re interior region here, which is basically our canvas. Um, and what we're going to do is take this atomic force microscope probe and apply a voltage uh, between the probe and the, and the interface. And what that's going to do is locally switch the interface from an insulating state to a conductive state. Um, and, the, and this happens basically through a, a protonation process, which I won't go into because of time. But basically, we put protons from water on the surface, and they attract electrons to the interface. And they locally switch the interface from the insulating state to the conductive state. Um, and we can also reverse this process. So we can write, and we can, uh, and we can do this um, with very high resolution. So basically, uh, this is an experiment that we published back in 2009 showing that uh, once you write a wire, you can measure the conductance of the wire and then very across uh, and erase the wire. And you see the sharpness with which you can erase it. It basically gives you a length scale, uh, which is the, the, the width of this wire, which is about 2 nanometers. Uh, and so, uh, in some sense, you can think of this as uh, an ultra-dense 2D array of non-volatile field effect transistors where the presence or absence of these protons determines whether or not the interface is conducting below. But um, I would argue that that vastly undersells what we have here, because this is not just a semiconductor, right? This is a material that elicits essentially every major property in the solid state. So it's really the combination of all of the varied properties of this material with the ability to control it at nanoscale dimensions that sort of give rise to this idea of that there might be something to this idea of correlated nanoelectronics. Um, and so over the years, we basically just started sort of free expanding um, in all directions, um, starting with room temperature, because we weren't a low temperature lab uh, originally. Um, and uh, we basically would um, uh, make things like transistors and uh, you know, nanoscale diodes and photodetectors and um, looking at magnetic properties. It turns out that you can control the, ma the ferromagnetic state at room temperature uh, uh, with a, an electrical gate. Um, uh, and then we also developed a terahertz spectroscopy platform and so forth, uh, integrate with graphene. But uh, we also started to go to low temperatures, thinking that maybe there would be some interesting quantum properties. Um, and so one of the first things we did with a rigged up you know, 10K cryocooler was make a single electron transistor. Um, and that really sort of started uh, to snowball um, in the low temperature uh, regime. And basically, we went to the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory because they had a dill fridge. Uh, they also had a magnets, but you know, we were interested in their in their fridge. Um, we would use that you know, once, um, uh, one week out of every four months or so. Um, and then basically, we began to, so, sort of, that began to take off. We began to make nanostructures um, in our own laboratory with, um, uh, with our own dilution refrigerators and, and, and explore some of the fundamental properties, which I really won't get into too much. Um, uh, but basically, what I wanted to, to, to tell you is that we, we think that this might be a way to do quantum simulation. And, um, and what we decided strategically was to focus on 1D systems, and, um, because 1D systems are easier theoretically to compare uh, with experiments. Um, and so 
Uh, more generally, um, you know, this idea of making sort of synthetic quantum matter, of course, this is in some sense what people do in material science. They have the periodic table and they can mix things together, but they're sort of limited in what they can do. Um, but uh, we know that there are certain combinations of atoms that do really wonderful things, like uh, have a superconductivity close to room temperature. So we want to understand why, and of course, uh, you know, you, you heard uh, Andy Mills' talk about the theoretical uh, direction, but there are other really interesting uh, systems like quantum spin liquids um, uh, 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 that have interesting ground states, ones that might be potentially useful for quantum information, for example. Um, so the idea of quantum simulation is really to find some analog uh, system, uh, physical matter, uh, whose Hamiltonian description um, can somehow be mapped onto the system of interest. Um, and uh, this has really been um, uh, very successfully uh, pursued in the context of ultra-cold atoms and, and atomic, uh, basically, lattices, uh, where you can really sort of simulate um, this idea of have having atoms uh, moving between the standing waves uh, of light, but this is uh, very low temperatures. Uh, so we're actually, in some sense, very much inspired uh, by that work. Um, and notice that the materials that we're interested in are not so dissimilar from these high temperature superconductors. OK. Hit the wrong button. OK. So. Uh, um, you could think of maybe saying, well, I want to create a, a Hubbard model, something like a Hubbard model, where you can control the hopping. Uh, this is, comes from the potential uh, that we can control, this landscape that we can control with our conductive AFM lithography. Uh, but we also think that we can tune interactions. We have some evidence for that, that we can tune uh, not only the strength, but the sign of the uh, uh, interactions between electrons. Um, uh, but there are many you know, challenges, of course. Um, and so uh, what I really want to talk about and focus on is just a couple of examples. So basically, we need to start with something. So some initial Hamiltonian that we're going to sort of be our home base uh, in the whole space of Hamiltonians, uh, and then ask, well, what happens if we change uh, that base structure, uh, in, and how does that in, uh, impact the, uh, the properties that we can measure? So this is really sort of like um, uh, the, sort of the Feynman theme uh, in terms of quantum simulation. So I'm going to talk about uh, a two-parameter family of uh, one-dimensional electron waveguides, um, but I'm really going to focus on two of them because of the limited time. So I'm going to talk about this H0, which is basically a straight wire, and tell you uh, that it's actually a very clean system uh, from the sort of point of view uh, of understanding. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about a very uh, exotic thing, which is basically a spiral, which we think we know how to make now, um, and uh, talk about how that might induce a spin orbit in interaction. So uh, the straight wire, basically, um, sort of a very simplest uh, idea in one dimension, uh, uh, a 1D uh, electron waveguide or Luttinger liquid. Um, and um, basically, uh, it's sort of the, uh, the fermionic analog of an optical fiber. So in fibers, you have the transverse mo um, optical modes. Uh, and if you have a single mode optical fiber, then the, the field profile looks like this uh, TEM00 mode. But you can have higher modes as well. Um, but in, in optical fibers, you, of course, these are bosons. So you can populate them with as many um, uh, photons as you like. Um, at, in, with fermions, though, you're restricted. And that leads to a quantization of the electrical conductance. Uh, and so you get essentially E squared over H of conductance per channel. Uh, and so uh, if you were to open up the number of channels in a 2D, uh, um, in, a, in a constriction in an otherwise 2D system, you would find a sequence of steps. This was discovered in the late 80s. Um, and so what you're seeing is basically uh, the more, the wider and wider uh, transverse modes that are allowed. And in fact, a beautiful series of imaging experiments um, from uh, 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 the Topinga et al. Uh, showed that you could actually um, uh, image the transverse wave functions of the electrons and see how that contributes to the conductance. So uh, we're making these 1D waveguides. And basically, uh, they're sketched in this way that I described earlier. And what we might expect uh, is that the conductance would depend on how many of the electronic subbands are occupied. So if we just had the lowest subband, then we would get E squared over H. And as, as we uh, change the chemical potential, OK, uh, it says two minutes before the Questions, I have five minutes for questions? 
Okay. <laughs> well, I'm going to go quickly. So the point is that we understand how the waveguide works, right? Um, and so uh, it's basically a 1D problem, single particle. I could give it to on the final exam for my students uh, next week. So basically, these are the wave functions that you see in the upper right. Um, and then if you apply a magnetic field, you can change the, the bottoms of these bands and you get a predicted uh, electronic structure, which we see. So we think that we have very clean electronic waveguides. Um, however, there are some um, uh, subtle differences between the theory, which is on the bottom, and the experiment, which you see on the top. So experimentally, what we find is that actually these lines don't meet uh, at zero. They meet at something called a pairing field. So we also know that there's a very strong attractive electron-electron interaction, which leads to um, a paired ground state, which is not superconducting. Um, and so another example that you see here uh, is basically this line here, which up to about eight Tesla electrons are paired together, and then they split apart. Um, and you can see that in the quantized conduction going from 2e squared in the paired state to 1 and 3. This is actually reentrant pairing. So this is important um, for what I want to tell you about now. So basically, we think we know how to make um, spiral electron uh, uh, waveguides, and we're inspired by these chiral molecules, which also seem to have a, a spin uh, selectivity effect that is, a, that is related to their structure. So basically, what we do is we modulate the lateral position of the wire, and at the same time, we modulate the voltage, but we do it in quadrature. So we believe that this is going to create a spiral shape, uh, and then we're interested in understanding what happens. So what you may see here is uh, basically these sort of ribs uh, in the transconductance that you don't see in a control wire. And these are oscillations that uh, we believe are induced by a spin orbit field that has been engineered through this uh, process. And uh, so the picture that we have, the sort of working model right now, is that we have a magnetic field in the z direction. Uh, and then when the electrons enter the spiral wire, the uh, effective quantization axis is changed. So there's now a, a longitudinal component due to the spin orbit um, effective magnetic field. And the electrons process about this new axis. And depending on uh, whether they complete a full precession cycle or not, uh, they would either have a full transmission or a uh, partial reflection. Uh, and we see this in the, uh, uh, these, these characteristic signatures uh, of an engineered 1D uh, uh, spin orbit uh, interaction. So, and we've also sort of reproduced these in other devices. Um, and we don't see them in like 50 other devices where we don't uh, do this. So uh, let me summarize now. Um, again, I tried to give a, a brief introduction to this uh, emerging field of correlated nanoelectronics uh, and uh, the idea of one of the challenges that we uh, set for ourselves is to do quantum simulation, to take advantage of the control that we have uh, of a very rich physical system at the nanoscale, uh, and then uh, gave you an example of uh, one of the th one of our um, uh, we believe is a, um, our successes in one dimension is basically engineering uh, a new axial spin orbit interaction in these one D wires. So thank you for your attention. We have time for a couple of questions. between the theory, theory and the experiment, and uh, I don't know why there is a discrepancy. Is the model not adequate? Well, there, okay, there are lots of things that we don't understand. I would say that um, we are, um, from a like, real temperature-wise, if we think about quantum simulation, we're at pretty low temperature, so we can see interesting phases. But we have very high intellectual entropy, so we don't know the pairing glue, for example. We don't know about, we don't understand fully why there are attractive interactions between electrons. Um, there are other things that we do think we understand better, like the electronic structure. Uh, we can match to effective models, um, for example, for these 1D wires. But um, we do not have a full first principles understanding of every aspect of the system. It's much more complicated than what I've led you to believe. There are uh, structural degrees of freedom. Uh, that we believe play a, a, a very important, uh, if not defining, role in the transport. So there's a structural transition at 105 Kelvin, where the cubic unit cell becomes tetragonal, and there are other structural phases as well. Um, and those we, uh, can play a very important role um, in modifying the electronic properties, for example. 
So there's, uh, there's a lot that we don't understand. I mean, basically, superconductivity, why is this semiconductor a superconductor? This is really um, a mystery for about a half century. Uh, so superconductivity was discovered in 1964, and we still don't know why when you put very few electrons and you dope a semiconductor uh, that you would get a superconducting, uh, superconducting state. So um, there are many things that we don't understand about the base material, um, which in some sense precludes us from going forward, unlike in cold atoms where we, under, you know, we understand uh, the atoms themselves. And so um, we have a, yeah, so we have sort of complementary challenges in, in, um, that we face for, for quantum simulation. Great, let's thank Jeremy Levy again. <laughs> And the next talk will be given by David Pecker on the subject of mesoscopics with attractive fermions. It's not projecting yet. Yes, that's a good plan. It's detected the projector. Okay, hi everyone. So I would like today to tell you a little bit about our work on um, mesoscopics with attractive fermions. Usually mesoscopic systems have regular electrons which tend to repel each other. So here we have a new twist. We, instead of repulsions, have attractions. And our mission for this talk is to explore the multi-fermion bound states in one-dimensional systems which can appear when we have attractions. Okay, and there are two parts. First, I will uh, describe more in depth uh, the part that Jeremy started describing, bound states of multi-component fermions and the Pascal uh, conductance plateaus they cause. So here we have three different colors of, of fermions, green, red, and blue, and they make triumphs like this. In the second part, um, I will uh, go beyond the standard tamanaga lattinger liquid theory and discuss emergent mode uh, phases uh, and descendants in which we have basically multi-fermion bound states, but of single type of fermion. So all of these three fermions are the same. Okay, so um, I thank Jeremy for a great introduction. I don't have to explain the slide so much anymore. Um, what we are looking at is a sketched nanowire in the LAO STO interface. The length of the nanowire is somewhere between 100 and 1,000 nanometers, and the nominal width and uh, thickness is around 40, 20 to 40 nanometers. The nanowire is side-gated with this side gate over here, which in principle can control the chemical potential of the nanowire. And what these guys do is they measure the conductance of the nanowire, and here is the result. So here is a conductance plotted as a function of the side gate voltage. And what we see is the conductance starts at zero, then goes up to one quantum of conductance, then three quanta of conductance, six quanta of conductance, 10 quanta of conductance, and so on. Now, if these numbers look familiar, this is because you've seen them before in grade school, these are the numbers from the Pascal triangle. So here is the Pascal triangle, these are these numbers on the second row. Okay, so how comes there are numbers from Pascal triangle in this nanowire? Well, um, so first of all, I cheated slightly. I only showed you uh, a slice. Here is the full data where we have chemical potential and magnetic field. And what's plotted here is a transconductance. So each time there is a, a color peak here, that means the conductance stepped up by uh, some number of quanta of conductance. So from here to here, it stepped up by one. From here to here, it stepped up by two, uh, and so on, by three. Um, but what we see is something very peculiar. At certain values of magnetic field, 
uh, lines tend to come together. So instead of having two steps of one, we have a single step of two. And this is the origin of, uh, of the sequence, but what is the physics of it? Well, we have this waveguide model, which Jeremy started to introduce. We think that our um, uh, ballistic nanowire is basically like a waveguide, but it's not a waveguide for photons, it's a waveguide for electrons. And this waveguide, like any regular waveguide, has transverse modes in it. For example, here is a base mode, here is a first vertical mode, first horizontal mode, and so on. Now, the idea is the pattern of the uh, crossings of the subbands is the result of the modes of the waveguide. So by tuning the magnetic field, we tune the energies of these modes, and we can make them come together at certain points, and, uh, uh, and this results in the Pascal sequence of, uh, of crossings. There is a little bit of magic needed, though. There is one geometrical parameter that has to be fine-tuned in order for these crossings to occur. Now, of course, experiments never have magic in them, or almost never. <laughs> so we need some other principle to cause uh, the band bottoms to come together and cross precisely at single points or close to single points. And this, oh, I should have done this first. Um, yes, why, uh, why do we have uh, the plateaus? Well, as we raise the chemical potential, we occupy more and more transverse bands. Each time we occupy a new transverse band, our conductance increases by quantum of conductance. Okay, so now back to the problem. How do we make the things stick together? Well, uh, what we did is we wrote down a model in which we include attractive interactions, and that naturally leads to sticking together. And let me demonstrate how that works. So first, the model. We have a one-dimensional, multi-component, attractive U Hubbard model. So in our Hubbard model, we have hopping of three different kinds of fermions, or maybe two, uh, or maybe four, depending on which subbands we're dealing with. Uh, if the two fermions are on a single side, they attract each other. So the sign is negative. This is unusual. And we can also tune the chemical potential for each subband, either with the overall chemical potential or with the magnetic field. Now, the case, which is SUN symmetric, has been solved a long time ago by Betty and Anzats. And their uh, trions uh, or pairs appear naturally. Um, of course, in experiments, there is no such symmetry. So we use uh, density matrix renormalization group to investigate what are the typical properties of attractive models in one dimension. And here is what we find. So let's first start with this easy case, two components. So on this axis is plotted the chemical potential and magnetic field. And first, let's do non-interacting case. Well, we have uh, one component which gets filled above this line another component that gets filled above this line. And here we have uh, both components being filled. So we have a phase with two Fermi C's, but they're non-interacting. Now, what happens when we turn on attractive interaction? Well, this phase becomes unstable. And what it becomes unstable to is a pair phase where pairs of different types of fermions bind together. So we have a Lattinger liquid of pairs. So in this case, we can have conductance steps of one quantum of conductance, but we can also have a conductance steps of two. Okay, now let's play with three components. Three components, we have a richer uh, variety of phases. We can have a single component Fermi, surfa uh, Fermi liquid or Fermi surface. We can have pairs. We can have two different Fermi surfaces. We can have trions. We can have pairs plus a single Fermi surface, or we can have all uh, three different Fermi surfaces. Right. But what's important is this trion phase seems to be quite stable. Uh, so when we look at the phase diagram, here we have the vacuum. And above the vacuum is our trion phase. So here we have a stable region over a, some finite range of magnetic field where all three uh, band bottoms stick together. And we have a, a, a jump by three quantum of conductance. So we think these attractive interactions are exactly why in experiment we see stable plateaus at Pascal numbers. OK, so um, this is all cool. But now let me switch gears a little bit. Uh, oh, sorry, I should show the experimental data one more time. So here is the two band bottoms sticking together. And here are the three band bottoms sticking together. OK, now let's switch gears and talk about single component fermions. So 
can we get multi-fermion bound states with just a single component? So here, let's again write down a Hubbard-like model, uh, which has fermion tunneling, but also we are going to have fermion-fermion interactions. But now, because it's single component, we cannot have on-site interactions, right? Fermions can't sit, two fermions can't sit on the single site because of power exclusion. So what we are going to do is we are going to have an interaction with some shape so that fermions on neighboring sites can interact, on next neighboring sites, and on third neighbors as well. Now, depending on what these interaction parameters are, we can get different phases. So what do we expect to get? If all the interactions are repulsive, this is just the conventional case. We expect to get a Lattinger liquid of single fermions. Eh, a bit boring. Uh, now let's turn on some attractive interactions between nearest neighbors. Computer. Um, so what do we get here? Well, if this attractive interaction is sufficiently strong, it will cause fermions to bind into pairs. So now what we get is a Lattinger liquid, but not of single fermions, but of pairs of fermions. Pairs fold about. And then we turn on the next one, and we get a Lattinger liquid, but of trions. So uh, three fermions together, and then we make out of the three fermion molecules um, a Lattinger liquid. Okay. Uh, now, um, why is this model interesting? So uh, let's discuss the conventional paradigm of one-dimensional system. The conventional paradigm is that we have some sort of n-component tamanago Lattinger liquid, and then we turn on interactions. And these interactions can either create a charge gap or a spin gap, which result in descendant series like mod insulators, pair liquid, trion liquid, and so on. This is exactly what happened in the first part of the talk, right? But now, instead of a one-component, uh, uh, sorry, an, an n-component liquid, we have a one-component liquid. When that happens, we can no longer have these transitions. So what do we do? Well, we need to have some bypass beyond the standard tamanaga Lattinger liquid. And there is a pair of recent papers which showed how to do this bypass. Both papers basically say that there has to be a second emergent mode that appears near the transition at sufficiently strong interactions. So what the hell am I talking about? So here is a, a plot of the dispersion. Here is energy and momentum. Standard Tamanaga Lattinger liquid describes the low energy series uh, seri right here and right here. Um, what the paper suggests is there may be some sort of band bending or some other machinations which cause appearance of other low energy fermions, for example, over here. And then we can do pairing. Okay, so what happens in our case? Well, we do DMRG numerics. Um, DMRG is pretty good at treating one dimensional systems, so we trust this numerics quite well. Um, we also set the nearest neighbor and second neighbor interaction to be both the same and quite attractive. So this is not weak interaction, this is strong interaction. See the V1 and V2 are about the same scale as the hopping T. Um, and the third neighbor uh, interaction we send to be repulsive and also pretty strong. The reason why we need a strong third neighbor uh, repulsion is so that we don't make one giant clump of fermions. Right? If everyone is attractive, we just will make one giant clump, and that will be boring. Um, so uh, what do we find? Well, we use correlators and central charge to try to identify the phases. And here are the phases we find. First of all, we find a bunch of phases with central charge of unity. This means that they are basically single mode phases. And uh, by looking at correlators, we can find single electron phases, pair phases, and trion phases. So what does this mean? So for example, for single phase, we look at the two single particle, single, uh, at the two point single particle, single particle correlator, and we see that it decays algebraically, which means it is free to add single electrons to, to, to this phase. For the pair phase, we find that it decays uh, exponentially, but the two-point uh, pair-pair correlator decays now algebraically. So in this phase, we can add pairs for free. And likewise, in this phase, we can add trions for free. Now, we find something else interesting. We find a phase right here, um, which has central charge two. Right. This is different. This is not something that was naively expected. Um, and what's more is that uh, uh, single uh, pair and uh, trion correlators all decay algebraically in this phase. So what is this phase? Well, we identify this as a phase with a second emergent mode. What are its properties? 
Well, let's go ahead and take a cut through the phase diagram, going from the trine phase to the pair phase, and look what's going on in the middle. So here is the cut, and what we are plotting here is a Fourier transform of the two-point correlation function. And the reason why we want to look at the Fourier transform is we want to see where are the peaks in this correlation function, which would correspond basically to the Fermi points. Right? So if we had just a regular Fermi leaf, we would expect to see one peak at Kf. What do we see? Well, here is a wave vector. Here is the cut parameter. In the middle of the 2m phase, we indeed see a peak at Kf, but we see a second peak appearing right here at K prime. Moreover, this peak is not fixed to a single K prime. It's moving. Right? What does this mean? We have one extra mode that has a Fermi surface on it. And moreover, the Fermi surface is shifting as a function of our parameter. Right? And not only is it shifting, it's shifting in a very clever way. It's interpolating between pairing at zero momentum and trions. Trions have to make a Fermi C since they're uh, fermions at Kf over 3. Right, so we have a chargeless mode which appears in the system, and it nicely interpolates between pairs and trions, which indicates that this 2M phase is kind of special, and, um, and we really should think about it deeper. Right? So we have developed a theory and a corresponding paradigm in which we say that the one component Lattinger liquid is not the base theory for everything. The new paradigm is that the two mode theory is a base theory. Then by adding symmetry allowed locking terms, we can get either descendant phases like single uh, electron liquid, pair liquid, trion liquid. We also find quaternion liquid, uh, both in theory and in numerics. And from these, we can further break down into things like mod insulators. OK, excellent. Um, so this work is, uh, is on the archive if you want to see more. Uh, before stopping, I would like to advertise other work that uh, my group is doing on, uh, on mesoscopics with proximate attractive interactions. So first part is being done by our postdoc, John Stenger, and he's worked out two nice problems recently. One is a proposal for flux-controlled braiding of Majorana zero modes. So in the middle here, we have this device with like a Mercedes-Benz star. If this looks familiar, you might have seen it in a little movie. Right, this is a flux capacitor, which with some large number of gigawatts sends the DeLorean back to the future. Uh, on our in our case, we have our flux capacitor with some application of picawatts, which sends my run zero volts around each other. <laughs> okay, um, and another, uh, uh, right, and of course my run zero modes require attractive interactions, superconductivity, and so on. Um, another interesting problem uh, that recently uh, that we're working on is uh, vial points and system of quantum dots. And here, uh, uh, the proximate attractive interaction actually is what allows you to have vial points uh, in this kind of parameter space. And the other side of the advertisement is a collaboration with uh, Francois Domenet and Andrew Daly over at Strathclyde in which we are developing a quantum optics inspired formalism for describing transport in these systems. And the first part of this, uh, or the first fruit of this labor is uh, an approach for doing buff engineering, which can be used to study uh, how Cooper pairs reflect off the quantum dot uh, between two different superconductors and result in a nice spectrum of uh, um, and ray of reflections. Okay, so let me put up the, the outlook and thank you for your attention. Thank you. I think we can take one question. Andrew. Can you say physically why, if you have pairs and then trions, doesn't the phase separate? If we have two clump and then three clump, why not all of them go to a separate? Uh, so uh, b uh, we have third neighbor repulsion. So uh, the, the trion is happy. But if we try to bring two trions next to each other, they become unhappy because of the third neighbor repulsion. So that means there's a critical value of the third neighbor repulsion above which? Yes, precisely. If we take third neighbor repulsion to be a, a weak or attractive, then it will certainly face separate. Right. OK. OK, let's thank all the speakers of the morning.
till 1040, I believe.
everybody. We're going to get started in a minute or two if everybody can take their seats. Well, welcome to the uh, late morning session. And the first speaker is Shi Hong Chen from Purdue University on stochastic nanomagnets for probabilistic spin logic. Okay, thank you, Randy. Uh, good morning, everyone. So, first of all, I would like to really thank the um, uh, organizing committee for inviting me here. Actually, in the morning, I, I arrived late last night, and in the morning, I really heard a lot of exciting research actually in the quantum computing side. So that's a really a good crowd to be with. And so um, actually in my 40 minutes, I'm going to introduce a new type of computing scheme that um, we call probabilistic computing that is uh, proposed by Professor Super Data actually at the uh, Purdue University. And then after I introduce uh, what is the probabilistic computing, I will also uh, show you what we have experimentally demonstrated that we believe that the stochastic nanomagnets actually are the natural hardware implementation of uh, probabilistic computing based on spin logic. So first of all, we started to look into spin logic actually a few years back. Why did we do that? Actually, that is because of the foreseeable bottleneck of uh, our current computer architecture, basically the von Neumann architecture. As an engineer, we know that um, our current computer has the CPU and has memory sectors. And normally when we want to do the um, computation, the CPU has our billion transistors and the logic gates inside, and um, a control unit in the CPU actually has to go to an off-site memory sector, normally our RAM, withdraw the data and the um, programs, the codes, then come back to the arithmetic logic unit to do the computation. And when the computation is finished, then you need to take all the data, all the results, go back to the RAM and the store it. And so that transferring data back and forth between two sectors, obviously, is um, time consuming and also energy consuming. And with our exponentially increasing interest in the computation speed and also the, um, the memory storage space, this actually becomes now really the bottleneck of uh, our computing. And that's why a lot of researchers in the field started to look into solutions. Maybe we can look for some type of memory that attached to the logic units or maybe in the memory sectors, we can start to introduce simple logic operation. So this is um, the research related to looking for logic in memory solutions or memory with logic functions. And a lot of groups have proposals. And here I would like to point out, it is non-trivial to design a logic unit. I know some of you are not in the engineering field. So maybe you have seen a lot of switches, two terminal switches, and they are not qualified as a logic unit. We actually have five very strict requirements to be a logic device. If you look at our current MOSFET, the transistor used in current industry, then we have an input that we apply gate voltage as input, and we measure the source strain current. We can apply this current to your load. And so we have actually a three terminal device that we, the input and the output are isolated. And when we measure the output current as a function of the um, input voltage, you actually need to see a nonlinear characteristics. That's very critical actually to have current and voltage gain. And then also you need to make sure that your device can transfer the information directionally, only transferring information from the input to the output, not vice versa, right? So this directionality is also very critical requirement here. And uh, another requirement is that uh, you need to be able to interconnect all these switches, all these logic units into a large network to do your computation. So this, um, this interconnection also requires that you to have a three terminal device instead of a two terminal device. You cannot interconnect two terminal devices in a large network with the compatibility of uh, transferring information. And the last but not the least, you need to also prove that your logic device can deliver the incomplete set of Boolean operations. 
So uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Superdata, actually proposed the quite a few spin logic devices, which all satisfy these five conditions. And um, while we were looking, uh, while we were working on these devices, uh, one of them is called the charge coupled spin logic CSL device. And um, you can see that um, in his design, that we do have the input that you, we can also call the right unit. And the right unit basically is trying to convert electrical signal into magnetization information. Because we would like to have a logic device with memory function. And the magnets are the natural storage of the information. And so you can design different um, physics here. Like um, in this specific implementation, we have a giant spin hole effect materials which can convert charge current into spin current. And spin current can manipulate the magnetization of the magnet sitting on top. So that's our right unit. And you can see the um, logic and the, the memory is already combined here. And then we need to have uh, an electrically isolated uh, readout unit, uh, or the output you can call. This output also has uh, another magnet, which will sense the magnetization information from the right unit, but will not send its own magnetization information back. So we need to engineer actually the di either bipolar coupling or exchange inf um, uh, coupling through this um, uh, 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 to, to ensure this uh, directionality here. And then for the read unit, another job this read unit needs to do is to again convert the magnetization information back to the electrical information so I can pass the electrical signal to the next stage for the concatenation. And as here, we can either build an NTJ readout, or we can use the anonymous hole effect to read out the magnetization information and translate it into electrical signal. So this is uh, an output characteristic showing a CSL's um, a performance that we definitely have a nonlinear characteristics. In the meantime, we have this hysteresis type of um, um, loops that showing this is um, the, the, the device actually contains um, the, the nat natural physics of uh, a magnet. Right, we, ha we can store information actually in the magnet. And uh, while we were working on the CSL device for quite a few years, trying to improve its um, uh, operation switching speed and also trying to um, um, reduce uh, the energy consumption of these devices, Professor Data actually came up with a, a brilliant idea that we are now trying to implement. He said that in the CSL device, if we can somehow engineer these magnets in a very special way, that when you look at the average magnetization of these magnets as a function of the electrical input, again, this electrical input can be anything, can be current, can be voltage, depending on your mechanism. And if you can somehow achieve this, we, we call sigmoid function dependence. And I will explain what is sigmoid function dependence. If you have a device with these very special characteristics, then you can really expand your application space to be much more beyond what CMOS computing can do. And um, uh, through his simulations and also now with um, experimental demonstrations, we show that um, this uh, um, what we call now probabilistic spin logic device, like all the circuits made out of these uh, PSL devices can actually not only do the logic operation, but actually can do logic operation in an invertible way, which actually the quantum computing has, um, has um, quite some examples in this field. And also, if we can manage to interconnect um, a few of them or even a large group of them into a network, and uh, if this network can, through the right interconnection design, can map any physical systems, we can actually solve also optimization type of problems, such as traveling salesman type of problems, or um, the, um, we can also apply it to um, belief networks, like Bayesian networks, to predict uh, future events. So I will show you actually some of these examples, how we actually applied it to the application, this application space. And interesting enough, um, just the last week, I saw like um, in uh, IEEE Spectrum, uh, to, um, the March uh, edition, um, the Intel lab director, uh, Dr. Rich Ulig, actually was interviewed. And uh, he, he pointed out that now, of course, uh, at the end of the um, most law, like um, what are the semiconductor companies are doing now? So Intel is going to focus on three computing schemes. One is quantum computing, one is neuromorphic computing, and another one is probabilistic computing. And we actually work uh, very closely with SRC. Actually, the entire, uh, this entire project was funded by SRC here. And um, so he actually points out the uh, probabilistic computing allows us to deal with uncertainty 
in natural data around us, as well as predicting events in the world with an understanding of data and the model uncertainty. And he further goes that the predicting what will happen actually can only be done if we know how to model the world around us with probability distributions. And I will show you how a PSL device can actually really model the probabilistic distributions. So here, these are some, uh, one example from Professor Data's uh, simulations. And actually, they just recently submitted a paper that um, they actually ex um, implemented that into FPGA. So that will be a hardware implementation. That um, they show that um, with a PSL device with the um, sigmoid curve, that if you interconnect few of them, like say for example three of them, you can form an AND gate or an OR gate. If you interconnect 32 of them, you can even form a four adder. And we know these are the basic logic gates used in CMOS, compu CMOS computers for our logic operations, right? And the different from our CMOS computers, here, like when we interconnect these um, PSL devices, they actually form a network that um, each unit is a stochastic variable. And um, through electrical annealing, this system is looking for its ground state. And this ground state is the solution of the question you are mapping for. Like for example, if the end, then the solution will be the result of the end gate. If we are um, mapping to a full adder, then the solution will be the, the adder's results. And they also found out that if they smartly design some of the interconnection to be directional, actually this adder, this 32-bit adder can operate like a subtractor as well. So this is the invertible logic that a com normal computer actually cannot do. And this is this, exactly this 32-bit adder um, example. So when we interconnect 32 of these PSL bits together, that um, when you, uh, the, the, through the spy simulation, when you give two large numbers, and uh, this um, uh, PSL circuit will tell you that what is the sum of these two numbers. But different from the normal CMOS computer, that the CMOS computer will tell you the sum is this, this, this number, 100%. There is no inaccuracy from a CMOS computer. But here, our PSL circuit will tell you this sum is 40% probability. And the, but the, the program will still pick this as an answer to tell you this is my result because that with 32 bits, I have two to the 32 states in my system. And out of these two to the 32 states, each one has a probability to show up as my answer. And this answer shows up with the highest probability. And so you can see this system that I can do the normal logic operation in a very different way compared to what the CMOS uh, logic gates are doing. And uh, you may argue with me, hey, why do I want a computer from you that you tell me that uh, adding two numbers is just um, with a probability of 40% to reach the correct answer. I don't want a computer like that. And um, although, like first, uh, the accuracy actually is it's good, right? I will not pick any other states here because of the probability is much smaller. But I'm not going to argue with you I want to use this computer for adding. But I want to tell you the exciting part is that exactly the same circuit without any other changes or modifications, we can do subtractor. We can do subtraction. So you can see that uh, this circuit, if you claim the result and claim the wild input numbers, this circuit will tell you what's the other input numbers. And this is what the CMOS cannot do. And um, like in the paper that they submitted, actually they show that for multiplier, you can do exactly the same thing. It will behave as this invertible logic gate that when you can do the multiplication like what the CMOS can do, at the same time you can have a factorization done exactly with the same circuit. And we know factorization is a large number factorization is an impossible task actually for CMOS computing. And the quantum computer is famous, Shaw algorithm is famous to solve large number factorization. And here with our PSL circuits, we are targeting exactly the same goal. And uh, here I want to give you a little bit of um, our picture where we position our probabilistic bits are. So we know that um, our digital, digital computing is using all the memory devices like MRAM, MTJs, and we, you have zero and one bits, right? These are the classical bits. And then we have our quantum computing, quantum computers with qubits, which are elegant, coherent superpositions of zero and one. 
and we think our probabilistic bits are in between. These are classical systems that we talk about the magnets here, but we are going to design these magnets in a such a special way that the magnet is going to jump between its two possible states randomly. You can see that this actually is uh, our experiment measured data. One magnet, is, one magnet is showing its magnetization as a function of time jumping between two states all the time. And uh, we call this now probabilistic bit just in contrast with uh, quantum bits, qubits. And if you interconnect a group of them together, you can form P circuits. And eventually, we are targeting probabilistic computer. And uh, what can we do? How can we reach this type of characteristics out of magnet? Current industry will look at these magnets and thought that they were junks and throw them away. And these are actually exactly the devices we want to use actually in PSL. So we know that the normal magnet, classical magnet, has those up and down states. And these two states are separated by a really large energy barrier. Normally industry is looking for 40 kT, 60 kT energy barrier in order to make sure that the retention time of the magnets are, is on the 10 years to 20 years um, time frame. That's why our computer can store the information for many years, right? And we are actually going to engineer this energy barrier so that um, my barrier is so small that the magnet will naturally jump between these two states. So that's what we are going to do. And uh, before I go to the experimental section, I want to show you that um, um, what type of problems we are targeting. I already mentioned uh, the invertible logic and the optimization type of problem. And we know that in the quantum computing field, like a D-wave type of companies are targeting a specific type of quantum computing problems, which are mainly relying on transverse icing uh, Hamiltonians. These are the problems that were solved the, uh, through the quantum annealing that they can solve um, uh, a lot of optimization type of problems, for example, traveling salesman's problems, and also the invertible logic, including the factorization. And so basically, you have uh, these uh, qubits interconnected into the circuit, ideally, and uh, through the quantum annealing, they should find their ground states. And the ground states should be the solution to the, to the famous uh, traveling salesman's problem, or to the solution for the factorization of a large number. And uh, what we, um, Superior's uh, postdoc, uh, Karen, actually last year published a very important paper in our mind that he found out that the p-bits can actually emulate this type of quantum computers completely. And um, the, um, mathematically, actually, it was already proven in 1976 that the d-dimensional quantum Hamiltonians can actually be completely mapped out by d plus one dimensional classical Hamiltonians. And what Karen did here is to prove that uh, with um, an, 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 like say, n number of uh, replicas of these classical d plus one uh, Hamiltonians, his qubits, he can actually completely map out the um, quantum annealing problems, like for any of these problems. And um, we call that actually poor man's qubit because we don't have coherent, uh, coherence among these different bits. But at the same time, it operates at room temperature. We don't need to go to extremely low temperature. And uh, another big advantage is that the industry did knows how to deal with MTGs, how to deal with uh, all the magnetic bits, right? So we just need them to modify the energy barrier to some extent. Immediately, we can have one billion of these bits together without waiting until 50 bits of the qubits to be put together, right? So these are the advantages of uh, our um, our pivots and um, obviously the application space is um, extending to a part of the quantum computing uh, scheme. And so here I will start to show you what we have done experimentally. So basically first I need to build my uh, building block, the, um, the probabilistic bit, which we call p-bit. And the p-bit basically is a three terminal device as I emphasized at the very beginning. We want a logic unit so we can interconnect them into a circuit for different functioning. And that requires me to have a three terminal. So I will show you how we build a three terminal later. And we will need to have a tunable random number generator. And this random number generator is also a very important uh, um, component, actually, for internet uh, security. For the um, cryptographic systems, actually, random number generators are commonly used. Right, so we, our device actually has a lot of potential for different applications. And so let's look at um, how to create this uh, sigma the function that I emphasized at the beginning of the talk. That this is a cartoon, it's uh, similar to the CSL illustration that I showed. 
we have the input, the right unit. I can have current as the input, or I can have a voltage as the input, and the right unit is my magnet. Right? And then I have the black electrical insulation, then I have my read unit with another magnet, which should sense what the right magnet is doing. And then here, I need to have the electrical output, as the MTJ can do the job, or actually I will show you experimentally here, we are using anonymous hole effect to read out the, the magnetization information. And the, the device, the magnets need to have this behavior that its average magnetization as a function of the input shows the sigmoid, which is a hypertangent function. How do we achieve that? Because of our magnets have a small energy barriers, they are jumping with uh, as a function of time between the two states. And if you, I have zero input, zero current input here, basically the magnets will jump between up and down states with 50, almost close to 50, 50% 50 of uh, probabilities. Now if I start to apply positive current that can actually influence the magnetization direction depending on what type of um, um, device physics I'm using here. For example, the spin hole physics I mentioned, right? You can actually influence the magnetization of the magnet sitting on top. Then when I apply positive current, my device actually sits most of the time in the upper state, while a few times it comes down to the bottom states. You can see the probability between the two states are very different now with positive current. And with negative current, I will pick the down state more often compared to the up state. And when you have the summary plot here, you see when I have zero input, the magnet is really just jumping up and down. The blue one is as a function of time. It's really jumping up and down. Once I start to have um, more positive current, most of the time it's staying, uh, staying on the upper state, and from time to time it jumps down. So the red curve here is um, the average of my magnetization information, which shows uh, this um, input, this um, a, a hypertension dependence on the input current. Right, so this is my device. And how do we actually get a, a magnet which is um, um, jumping, which we call stochastic magnet, because it will jump between the two states. We know that the retention time for magnet is um, described by this simple relation here. Tau zero is the material property. Depending on you are using um, cobalt iron boron or permaloy, this tau zero will have different values. Normally, typically, it's between 0.01 nanoseconds and 1 nanoseconds. Then we see that the retention time is exponentially dependent on the energy barrier versus KT. And as I mentioned, industry wants to have really large K, uh, energy barrier, 40, 60 KB, uh, KT, so that it can have 10 years, 20 years of retention time. And we realized that we want the magnet to fluctuate between the two states at really high speed. If we want a gigahertz speed in order to do fast computation, we need to scale down the energy barrier down to KT, basically. One KT or few KT, that's our we'll goal. And we call these low barrier magnets or stochastic nanomagnets. And um, like um, in my group, actually, we have um, looked into different magnets. We know, like, uh, if you are working in the magnetic field, you know that we have uh, magnets with in-plan um, anisotropy or magnets with uh, perpendicular um, uh, anisotropy, IMA, in-plan magnets, or PMA, uh, per perpendicular magnets. And we actually have developed the two methods to reduce uh, the energy barriers for each magnet, for both IMA and the PMA. I will show you all these four methods now. So for the magnets, we know the energy barrier is, pro is a product of the anisotropy field and the magnetic moments, ms times the volume v. And so you can either scale down the anisotropy field, hk, or you can work on the msv, trying to make the volume of the ms small to make your energy barrier small. So here, the first um, case that we try to reduce hk, how do we reduce HK? Basically by patterning the magnet into perfectly circular. Once I have no easy access, no anisotropy field in plan, then the, and the, the, each magnet, each disk that I show in the SEM here actually is going to have its magnetization rotating 360 degrees in plan. And then because we don't have an electrical readout for this system here, we fabricated 25 millions of these circular disks and took a squid measurements. You see the desired sigmoid curve exactly showing up. The reason that we have this is at zero field, why do I have zero magnetization? Because these 25 millions of these circular disks are all circling at any given moment. And because of they are out of sync, 
that uh, the average of their magnetization together as a network is zero. And uh, until that I start to apply some um, input, like uh, for example, magnetic field, a vertical magnetic field as a simple demonstration here, then you can start to guide the magnets towards one direction or the other direction. And we also worked with um, the MSV reduction like here, we keep the oval shape. Normally, the um, uh, industry's um, um, memory bits actually are oval shaped because we want to have an easy access. And we keep the um, oval shape, but the volume has been decreased uh, by uh, patterning the, the size to be very small. And then again, we take a, we fabricated 100 millions of these um, magnets and take the squid measurement at the three different temperatures. You see for the 300 Kelvin and 200 Kelvin, the black and the red curves, again, we got the desired uh, sigmoid curves. That shows that uh, all these magnets, they have low energy barriers. Although they have easy axis along the long, long axis, the magnetization is jumping between up and down, like uh, for most of them at any given moment. And that's why the average, again, shows a sigmoid curve. But when we lower the temperature to 100 Kelvin, then the thermal energy now is comparable or even lower than the um, barrier energy of my magnet, then we start to see the normal mag magnet's behavior. This uh, hysteresis curve now starts to show up, right? So this temperature dependence always proves to me that we are actually working with uh, the retention time of the, um, the, the magnets here. And then, like, uh, while um, between these two methods, for university demonstration, we have easier time to make uh, this um, low energy barrier because uh, we know that by patterning to circular, I have almost zero an entropy field. So my energy barrier is close to zero. I have very fast fluctuating magnets here. Whereas the other way, when I try to make a small oval shapes because of the limitation of our lithography, like we still have a rather large energy uh, barrier here on the, on the 9 kT, 10 kT side. But for industry, they know how to make a small magnets. I know like uh, nowadays the uh, MRAM, STT RAM is already reaching one gigabytes, right? And so like uh, for industry, this shouldn't be the limitation. They can easily pick uh, either direction to scale down the energy barrier. One thing that I want to point out, depending on the application you are looking for, the pinning field will be different between these two methods. For example, here, if both of the methods, uh, I don't know why the thing is not showing clearly, both of these curves are showing for the one KT magnet, but the red one is when I use uh, the um, HK scaling method, and blue one is using the um, MSV scaling method. You see the pinning field to really pin down the magnet at a certain direction, it requires much larger pinning field when I do the um, MSV scaling. And so again, depending on the application, you may want to pin down the magnet at a different pinning field. So you will need to pick a, um, which method is more suitable for the application you have in mind. And now let's talk about the um, PMA um, energy barrier scaling. We also have two methods. For PMA, these uh, magnets have a perpendicular and isotropy, um, uh, and uh, like normally it's auto plan. And we can also reduce the energy barrier, actually now by not only scaling down the area, but also working on the thickness of the magnetic film. That is because the energy barrier is proportional to the volume and the anisotropy energy density. The energy density is described by the interfacial uh, anisotropy energy and the demagnetization energy. For the normal IMA magnet, implant magnets, the first term is very small because my thickness is large. So the second term, the demagnetization energy dominates. That's why my, my implant magnet always has the implant um, uh, magnetization. But for PMA, once my thickness becomes smaller and smaller, the first term can become really large, eventually to even cancel the demagnetization energy term. And that's when I can actually reach zero energy density by tuning the thickness of my PMA film. And that's basically what we do. So in order to calculate the effective um, 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 anisotropy energy, we basically need to measure the anisotropy field because it's a product of the MS and HK. So here we fabricated a PMA magnet with different thickness and fabricated the whole bar structures. Then we can extract exactly HK for each thickness. For example, here for one nanometer magnet, we have extracted its um, anisotropy field to be around 248 millitesla. And uh, if, you plug, if you have all these different thicknesses plotted together, we see exactly the anisotropy field decreases with thickness 
and that's why the effective energy decreases with um, thickness. At some point, you can reach almost close to zero energy barrier. And we realize actually annealing all these uh, fabrication processing steps actually can impact the, the, the effective energy of our magnets. Once we picked the annealed uh, magnets, we decided the 1.3, 1.4 nanometers is roughly the sweet zone that we want to work with, that our PMA magnets actually can have a rather small energy barriers. And as I mentioned, that um, um, the, the random number generator, because we have the magnetization jumping between the two states, and once you guide the magnetization information out by electrical signal, these are exactly fluctuating resistance states. And these uh, fluctuating resistance states are perfect random number generators that are used actually in a lot of uh, cryptographic systems. And currently, actually, there are not a lot of good hardware implementation of uh, random number generation. So the, a lot of systems are actually using pseudo random number generations from simulations or from software, which actually can be tagged or can be, can be really tackled, right? So the, the security of uh, pseudo random number generation is not very good. And for hardware random number generations, there are some implementation, and we will show that it's always actually the most uh, energy efficient and uh, also the, 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 the quality of our random numbers are very good. So here, by having our magnet, the low barrier magnet, um, fabricated on a whole bar structure, we can actually measure the anonymous hole effect. So we don't need to make a complicated MTJ stack to read our electrical information. With PMA, we can easily read out the magnetization information through um, the anonymous hole effect. And uh, this is uh, the example I already showed earlier, that um, as a function of time, you see the magnetization is jumping, which is uh, reflected as the anonymous hole resistance here between the two states all the time. And then um, you can uh, extract the, um, you can plot out the histogram for the dwell time in each state, and they actually both follow the Poisson dis distribution as expected. And you can extract the retention time, and um, the, the, um, basically between these two states, the retention time is about 65 milliseconds for the magnet we fabricated here. It's rather slow. So for the real logic operation, we will try to make the size here, the diameter is still 100 nanometers. Once you have the diameter smaller, it will fluctuate much faster. But here, for our experimental, first time experimental de demonstration, it's actually very nice because our locking is not that fast anyway, right? So having milliseconds to read is actually a rather easy measurement scheme here. And you can extract the energy barrier for these PMAs is on around the 20 K, uh, kT. Right, so it's not a very low, as low as uh, the IMA magnets I have shown, but it is a low barrier compared to what we are used to. And that's why they are fluctuating. And um, because of the application in the um, cryptographic uh, systems, that uh, we actually use the, uh, uh, take our random num number generations and the pass, um, pass all the um, sequence, all the data sequence actually through the NIST um, uh, STS suite, the um, statistic testing suite to test the quality of our random number generation. And you can see out of the package, the NIST package, there are about 16 tests we need to do. And we picked nine of them because uh, as a university groups, uh, my student cannot uh, take a lot of like 100,000 or mi million of these data. So we have uh, smaller groups that we can only um, test uh, these nine tasks here. And all of the p-values compared to a standard, uh, like a true random number generations, all the p-values uh, above 0 0.01 is considered to be uh, passing the test, and all of our tests actually have been passed. So we do have good quality random number generations here. And um, just um, to save time, I'm not going to go through the details, but just uh, to point out, compared to other hardware random number generators, also relying on magnet schemes, our um, system actually requires a very low energy because we basically only have the measurement, the current passing through. The magnet by itself is already at room temperature jumping. We don't need any other mechanisms to create this fluctuation, right? And um, also because of the PMA that the industry is able to, will be able to scale it down to really small size. So the, um, the potential of scalability is also very high. And now we have a, a magnet which can fluctuate, which can jump around. Now, how to actually introduce in the, in the experimental setting, how to introduce this um, sigmoid curve that we need to have an input 
that can change the magnetization preference or the probability. And with a simple magnetic field, it's very easy to achieve. And once we apply vertical magnetic field, immediately you see the sigmoid curve. But of course, for electronic devices, I wouldn't want to rely on magnetic field. I cannot, I need to have local control of each bit, right? So this is just um, a quick demonstration of uh, we can, through magnetic field, to change the, the, the magnetization preference. And the, the temperature study is similar to what I mentioned before. It's just to prove that this uh, sigmoid curve indeed comes from the random, random telegraph noise. Because when I go down to the temperature, when the retention time of the magnet is long, then you do not have the sigmoid curve anymore. So this temperature on the same magnet, decreasing the temperature, seeing the hysteresis curve being recovered, was the, 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 the proof that we do have a system that is randomly fluctuating. And then now let's come to the device. I would like to really control this input through an electrical means. So now we actually have our whole bar made out of giant spin hole effect material that actually offers spin optical torque. So I can really imp like a, uh, implant, uh, imp impact the magnetization of my magnet through the, the uh, GSHE layer. And so here we apply a DC current and again, you see the sigmoid curve through the, the giant spin hole effect, uh, SOT effect, that I, I, we were able to control the average magnetization, which is reflected by the anonymous hole resistance here. And uh, the last uh, method that um, we used uh, to control, the, um, to control the, um, the, the PMA's energy barrier, actually not energy barrier, but to make it stochastic, actually through this um, hard axis initialization. So we don't touch the energy barrier here anymore. But the, um, if we have a SOT effect from the giant spin hole effect layer, that um, once we pass the large SOT current, we will be able to pin the magnetization into implant, into the hard axis. And once I let the SOT current go, actually the, um, because the easy axis is auto plan, then it will either jump up or jump down with 50, 50% chance again. So this is uh, an electrical way of creating a stochastic magnet. And um, like uh, you can see, the, the original magnet is a normal magnet with the hysteresis curve. But once we apply this large SOT current, we can actually create the sigmoid curve. And again, without any input, because of the, 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 the equal probability of going up and going down from the hard axis, we have an average of zero magnetization. While if I start to apply magnetic field again, I can create the sigmoid curve. So this is um, the means actually we are trying to create stochastic magnets out of PMA mag uh, nanomagnets. And um, I want to use the PMA system in our um, experimental demonstration of a circuit, of a Bayesian network circuit. Because um, for the IMA, in order to read the magnetization information, I need to build an MTJ, basically. And that's a very tricky uh, processing to have a good quality MTJs out of university labs. And so here, for PMA, basically, I can use the um, uh, anonymous hole effect to read the electric signal. So this is my three terminal P bit that I have my input, which comes from earth state field, but I'm making a ring, so it is from electrical current. Right, so from this ring, I have either up or down or set the field. So that's my input. And then I have um, the um, anonymous hole as my readout, like uh, the same hole bar with my stochastic magnet sitting in the middle that I have already described. And the anonymous hole effect is my output. So now I have input and output, and they are electrical isolated. And at the same time, I have my stochastic um, magnet sitting there. So this is my p-bit. And um, you see that um, the measurement shows that um, I can have the, um, the clocking, that it applies the SOT current to initialize the, to the hard axis, then let it go, and I read the magnetization um, from the, the magnet. And you see exactly the fluctuation that we, I have already explained a few times that it will form the, the um, uh, sigmoid curve. Right? So this is our p-bit. Now, this is the last uh, uh, two pages that I want to describe the Bayesian network that we have experimentally demonstrated. For the first time, we actually have uh, implemented a Bayesian network in hardware. And so in Bayesian network actually, so far, other people have only implemented in software to predict, to forecast, for example, weather, or to predict the future events, right? 
And the Bayesian network uh, uh, tells you that um, um, you need to build a network that each node is a variable node, and uh, you need to tell the node, each node, what is the dependence among them. And you can basically describe these dependence by a conditional probability table called CPT table. So that's a standard uh, procedure in Bayesian network simulations, Bayesian theory. And uh, here we show that uh, we can basically hardware implement each Bayesian node with our p-bit. And we can control all the interconnections. Each bit is going to receive connections, and, um, like uh, inputs from its parent node. You can see this one, for example, has information from the parent node here, have an independent uh, input, and have another input from another parent node here. So you can basically, through a resistance or capacitance uh, coupling network, to control the, inter uh, the, the interplay among all of your nodes. So that's a Bayesian network. And I, last page, just one minute, I will be able to describe a quick example that we did. So this is, uh, like say we are working with, uh, we, we can work for um, cheese manufacturing. And they want to know what is the probability of their cheese go bad. So they know the lifetime of their cheese is, uh, is, is how long, right? So they can predict uh, for their manufacturing process, the storage, warehouse cost, all these type of things. And we work with a very simple example here. So the, um, it takes the two uh, Bayesian nodes the first one, the M1 node, will tell you the package, packaging material is high quality or low quality. If it's low quality, M1 is zero. If it's high quality, M1 is one. And the, um, the M2 node is the probability of the cheese go, going stale, becoming bad. And so you have the probability of going bad for the low quality and the probability of B going bad for the high quality. And um, basically, from Bayesian theory, you can calculate what is the probability of the, your cheese going bad, depending on what is uh, the observation of the dependence between the, the material quality and the, the cheese um, uh, stale uh, probability. So this CPT, this is called the CPT table, needs to be first defined by your experiment measurements of the, the cheese lifetime, right? And then you can calculate the probability. Then we can basically map the entire problem into our PSL with also two p-bits nodes. And we can actually control, like an, giving an independent uh, input and also control the dependence between the two nodes. And then here, because each p-bit is a, a um, sigmoid curve, so basically the output of uh, each one should be a sigmoid of its input. An input comes from the independent input and also the parent input from the M1. Right, interaction. And you can basically, I'm not going to go through the details, you can map out uh, our experimental interconnection J21 and H2 to the CPT tables A and B. The, the details that we will publish very soon, the paper is already submitted. And um, now this is our hardware implementation. My student physically built this system with M1 and M2 nodes that um, the interconnection J21 and H2 are implemented by the resistance network. He's tuning the op amps output voltage and also the resistance uh, in the network that he can design. And um, you see that um, when the interconnection between the two nodes is zero, there is no correlation between the two p-bits. When the interconnection is positive, the second M2 bit always follows the M2, M1 bit, at least most of the time. And when you have a negative um, interconnection, you actually have the uh, negative uh, uh, correlation. And uh, this is the final result that we show, like a Bayesian theory and um, stochastic uh, LLG simulations will predict the probability of the cheese going bad. And our experimental, the hardware, actually completely agree with uh, both theory and the simulations. So with our two nodes, we will be able to tell you what is the chance of the, the cheese going bad if you know the dependence between the, the material, packaging material and the cheese. And so with this, I would like to really thank my co collaborators and students. Obviously, this entire PSL idea comes out of uh, Professor Superior Data, right? So this is uh, his um, last, uh, I would say, three to four years of contribution, completely thinking through of this problem. And they are still on the way, actually, to tackle more of the quantum computing factorization type of problems. And um, uh, his uh, postdoc, uh, Karen, actually contributed a lot of, uh, of his, uh, his expertise into the simulation and uh, the mapping to the quantum system, actually, is his recent work published in 2018. And he's actually on the market. He's looking for faculty position if you are interested.
them. And we work with uh, Professor Data student Fari a lot. And um, my student Punya, he did most of the work. He's in a very close collaboration with uh, Professor M. Dallas, student of IBAF. And we also get a lot of measurements uh, support from our research scientists. And thank you very much for your attention. We'll take a question or two. is very important for, for the pivot, right? Uh, it's not very important. If you can have your barrier very, very small, you can work with 300 Kelvin, 400 Kelvin. So like, for example, for our implant magnet, the barrier is zero. So almost every temperature you will get the sigmoid curve. Okay. Because it's a uh, uh, energy barrier versus KT, basically. I was just curious, uh, as this f uh, these spins flip, do they generate heat? Uh, spin, uh, spins, actually, they don't. The magnets, when they are flipping, they don't, do not generate any heat. So there is no heat generation? No heat okay, uh, dissipation. Thank you. Okay, yeah. one, one more question there. Uh, so um, what is the main mechanism for your system to find a global rather than local minimum? Because I realize that, you know, what your system implements probably just whole field networks. Yeah, yeah. So right? like I think whole field through networks would annealing. go to, uh, to local minimum most of the mm -hmm. time rather yes, than... Yes, yes. Yeah, that is uh, actually very important. So for the quantum annealing, they were through the tunneling mechanism. You can actually tunnel out of the local minimum. And for our system, basically the noise, the, the fluctuation is a mechanism that it will get out of the local minimum. Yeah, and also the, um, the electrical annealing that we are applying. If you do it slower, the chance of getting of the, the local minimum is much higher. If you do it too fast, of course, sometimes you can be stuck actually at the local minimum, yes. But then you need to somehow decrease the hopping um, probability, right? You need to decrease this. Uh, for simulated you annealing to work, you need to decrease uh, the temperature as uh, you know you get closer and closer to the global minimum. You Otherwise, you just continue to jump, jump right, around. Right. So this electrical annealing should eventually cool down, and then you 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 find the the global minimum. Yes. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Let's thank the speaker again.